So the next, the next panel is uh, LGBTQ site preservation and international perspective, and, and uh, Ken Lusbader is going to be uh, moderating that. Ken is one of the founders of the New York City Sites Project and uh, was involved with the, the map that I mentioned that we did 25 years ago. Um, and so his, and really was a pioneer in this issue because he uh, did his master's thesis on, on um, uh, lesbian and gay preservation in Greenwich Village. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, uh, Columbia, for having us here. And as Andrew said, um, it's sort of bizarre for me to be here um, at a symposium on LGBTQ heritage when about 25 years ago I was a student here and came up with this harebrained idea to do a thesis in historic preservation on gay and lesbian history in Greenwich Village. So it's very gratifying to see that. Well, it seems like you know, two minutes, that's 25 years ago, progress has been made. So that said, um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're gonna shift the geographic focus and start looking at LGBT history um, is, with an international perspective. And I think the degree of LGBT site preservation and public recognition of LGBT past and history and culture can offer, often represent the state of LGBTQ rights and policies in that particular country. For example, in Western Europe, uh, there are various LGBT archives, documentation, oral history, mapping projects already in existence, which benefit from the paper trail uh, and record of historic resources that could be identified and voices to that point being made before. Um, also in Amsterdam, we have the Homo Monument. In Berlin, we have the Monument to Nazi Persecution. In San Francisco, we have the Ring Rheingold um, Leather uh, Monument commemorating leather culture in San Francisco. Yet elsewhere, where LGBTQ lives are criminalized and the battle for LGBT rights are being fought, the focus of site preservation is really non-existence and limited to obvious reasons. And we're going to hear about those issues. Um, the study of LGBTQ heritage in itself is a new field of inquiry starting basically in the early 1990s. Um, and that was basically 23 to 25 years after the Stonewall Uprising. So now in the US, we have the privilege of really looking back at the tangible past and making that tangible past have intangible benefits of pride, community, continuity, and identity. And we're hoping that that's what the goal of this preservation is doing. So as the fight for LGBTQ rights in other countries are being fought, uh, and political change and advocacy are being paved. I'm hoping that those countries are recognizing or taking stock of their own history so future generations, 25, 30, 50 years from now, can look back and have those uh, monuments discussed and presented. The first presentation is going to be via, via video, uh, and that is going to be a 10-minute video by Ankit Bhutani. He's a gay, right activist, gay rights activist in Mumbai, India. He's the founder and chairperson of the Gay and Lesbian Vishnasa Association and has organized the Mumbai LGBTQ Pride Parade since 2010. In 2014, he traveled throughout India and delivered over 500 talks discussing Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, which made sexual activities against the, quote unquote, against the order of nature illegal. And that code was repealed in 2018. And he wants me to make that point because in the video he said 2017. So I think that is gonna be the first. We're gonna then pause and I'll introduce Matt Cook who will go forward and then we'll continue the discussion. Um, I, I'm not sure if it was mentioned earlier. I just want to give people some reference points in terms of um, LGBTQ place-based information. If anyone doesn't know about it, the National Park Service put together the LGBTQ um, theme study in 2016. That's available online, and it's a great resource for those who are interested in historic preservation and the intersection of LGBT history. So that's just something I wanted to mention beforehand. So here we go. My name is Ankit. I'm from Mumbai, India. As a child, I always remembered that my mom used to take me to Indian temples and over there, one ritual she would make me do without a miss is the ritual called protection. A devotee enters the temple, especially any Eastern temples, a uh, devotee uh, goes around the circle of the deity or, or the god statue, whichever uh, the god statue is there in the temple. And the reason behind that is that it allows us to understand that the same truth has multiple dimensions. There is not 
one way to look at the things. There is not a single way to look at the lives and, and things around us. There, is, there are multiple ways to look at it. And till the time you do not include all these interpretations, all these thoughts as part of your own journey, you do not reach to the final destination of the truth. In your journey towards the truth, you need to accommodate all the truth which exists. And that is why we have this very beautiful ritual called as Pradakshina in an Eastern faith. In my presentation today, I am going to talk from my perspective, the way I look at the Indian queer history. Our mythology is full of queer characters wherein our gods have queer gender, sex, sexuality. The devotees around the gods have depicted queer gender, sex, sexuality. I'm going to talk about uh, two particular stories from Indian queer mythology, which plays a very important role to showcase how queerness was accepted and celebrated in India. We have a character called Shikhandi, which, which is coming from a very famous epic called as Mahabharata uh, from Indian scriptures where uh, Shikhandi is a queer character. Uh, she had both the gender. She was born in one gender and identified as the other gender. And, and she did a very important role in killing off a very powerful character named Bhishma. Uh, till the time Bhishma would have not been killed in the battlefield, the principle of Dharma would have not been established. So, we, uh, the, till the time a queer character does not enter the field of Mahabharata, uh, it does not reach to the end wherein we have a second uh, very celebrated god called lord shiva and her image is portrayed as ardhana rishwara wherein he accommodates his wife uh, devi parvati as half of his body and that's why we have this very beautiful picture and the deity called as ardhana rishwara wherein the ardhana rishwara is half man lord shiva and half female god goddess Devi Parvati and both are equally worshipable. Till the time a devotee does not accept Lord Shiva without Parvati or a devotee of Parvati does not accept Lord Shiva, their worship is not considered as complete. Both as Ardhanarishwar reaches to the completion of the devotion. We have a, a, like you know portrayal of queerness in our temple halls as well. It's not just the queer stories. So we have uh, around 52 temples in India which depicts queer gender sexuality. However, very famous are the group of temples in Khajuraho in Madhya Pradesh, India, wherein uh, sex is well portrayed in a very beautiful way which shows that uh, how sexuality was very much celebrated in, in ancient India till the time. Uh, we were ruled by other faith and, and by other uh, parts of other world. Uh, so we have temples, walls predicting queer gender and sexuality in an amazing way. Criminalization of homosexuality and queerness is alien to India because it was bought by British. They bought IPC 377 which is Indian Penal Code 377 which criminalized unnatural sex. And what was the definition of unnatural sex? Any sex which is not between Pino and vagina. So biblical idea of what is natural and unnatural. So it is because of the British, the criminalization of homosexuality happened in India. After that, uh, the Quit India movement happened, which is a very important part uh, in, in Indian history. A place from which Quit India movement started is from the Agast Kranti Maidan in Mumbai from where we are celebrating Mumbai Queer Pride Parade since 2009. From that place itself, Mahatma Gandhi gave a message to all the Indians to unite ourselves and fight against British but with non-violence. And, and the long battle of Quit India movement followed by many other uh, movements which led British to leave India. And finally, uh, in 1947, we got independence. The very famous and well-known character who played a very important role in Quit India movement is Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru who happens to become our very first Prime Minister of Independent India. A very important character called uh, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar who led uh, the Constitutional Committee in, in, along with Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi and he drafted 
uh, the constitution the constitution of india talks about in preamble uh, it talks about the principles of equality justice uh, and human dignity in human life however it they still continued uh, the criminalization of homosexuality so the indian penal code 377 which was there in british raj continued even after india got independent so me as a queer individual was still striving for my independence and not just me so many queer individuals like me had to fight up till now in 2017 when indian indian supreme court decriminalized homosexuality we were considered as criminals because of our sexual orientation uh, it was very difficult for people to meet each other people to socialize and know each other and make friends group Uh, so people used to meet each other in very closeted way there used to be uh, this magazine called as bombay those were which was the very first gay uh, magazine published in india and over there people used to give their post box number and that they will give a message that i will meet you on this date and and uh, uh, on this platform under the indic railway indicator and i'll be wearing a pink shirt or a blue shirt i'll be having a red rose in my hand and you can meet me so people used to meet each other without seeing their pictures or knowing them they, they all you used to know was their post box numbers and with the help of post box number published in the bombay dost magazine they used to have this personal letter exchange and then they used to share their thoughts and if you find somebody interesting you would meet them uh, and it, it used to be complete blind date and church gate station and csd station chatrapati shivaji terminus in that time it was called as victoria terminus railway station and church gate railway station in mumbai we were very happening place for meeting another very happening place uh, when internet was not very popular in india especially in mumbai was the gokul's bar which is just behind uh, the gateway of india and where uh, though it's not a gay bar uh, it's just a straight bar but on friday evening all the gay crowd and queens and queens of queer community used to gather around at this place and and meet each other and and socialize because these are the venues from where the movement of of, of quit 377 started of, of 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 the community mobilization started in which plays a so important role and then community get together and then decide that yes enough is enough we need to make our voices heard when i look at this journey it plays a very important role uh, in my individual life and many other people that we were born as criminal in the independent india and we got our independent after struggling for so many years really we have reached to the stage uh, wherein we could say that we have got our independent in an independent india in last in 2017 when indian supreme court decriminalized homosexuality and just after the supreme court's judgment the changes we are observing in the Uh, in a country in this country is phenomenal we is the, even the last pride parade which happened in 2018 second of february we saw 15000 people coming on the street marching for equality and not just queer community who were participant to that many corporate organizations we had a parents group of queer children called, called swikar Uh, marching on the streets of mumbai for equality and their rights uh, and the rights of their children we had a students group we had doctors association marching for equality we had senior citizens marching for equality not all of them were queer they were community supporters from straight community and all of this came together and marched for equality uh, we we are ch- seeing that so many educational institutes after the supreme court judgment making changes and making their hr policies inclusive they talk about sex gender and sexuality and not being discriminatory against any employee irrespective of whatever their sexual orientation be educational institutes being uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, gender and sexuality we are seeing uh, many support groups coming out in support of it so india is seeing a drastic change after supreme court's judgment on ipc 377 and we are moving towards good thank you very much we're now going to have matt cook speak he is a professor of modern history at burbeck 
Birkbeck College, the University of London. Matt is also a cultural historian specializing in the history of sexuality, the history of London and public history, and has worked extensively with museums, archives, and heritage sectors in the UK on issues of LGBTQ representation, most recently co-authoring the National Trusts of England's uh, Prejudice and Pride Guidebook, his current project is called Queer Beyond London, and he is co-authoring a book on the same name. So I'd like to now introduce Matt Cook. Thanks so much for inviting me and having me here. Thank you. I've gone for the combination of heritage camp in my uh, choice of PowerPoint slides. I should just say there's a health warning. You're getting this presentation through a fog of caffeine and jet lag, so it may go very off beam. But what I wanted to do uh, with my 15 minutes is to try and chart uh, the shifts in a relationship between LGBT public history in the UK and the museums and heritage sector over the last 15 or 20 years. And in a kind of scattergun fashion, flag up various examples, conundrums, and issues and debates um, that shift raises and which we might want to pick up um, in discussion later. How am I moving forward? Is it this? There we go. Ooh. Okay, so I primarily want to do this by focusing in on Brighton, which is the UK's uh, attempt at San Francisco, um, and community history and museum engagement in that local context. And then look at the National Trust, which is our main national heritage body, and the work that they've been attempting to, to do around LGBT heritage. But before I get to those two examples, I want to fill in a little bit of context, um, which explains some of these shifts over the last 15, 20 years. And there's quite a lot of information here, but I just want to give you the kind of headlines. Um, the first headline is that the new Labour government between 1997 and 2010 legislated for social inclusion and equality um, and forced publicly uh, funded bodies to take these issues seriously. The second key uh, context was the repeal of Clause 28. So Clause 28 was this absolutely notorious measure introduced by the Thatcher government in 1988, which forbade local authorities from promoting homosexuality. So when this measure was um, was repealed in 2004, the shackles in a sense were off and local authorities and the museums and libraries that they funded were able to engage more freely in these issues. So this was a huge shift. And in a way, what I'm doing here is, 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 is riffing a bit on what Ankit was saying about the importance of legislative change. You know, it actually had some impact in the UK in terms of the historical environment um, that we were then able to occupy. The Heritage Lottery Fund had, until 2002, only been allowed to invest in capital projects, like, for example, the refurbishment of the Royal Opera House. But from 2002, the government changed its remit so that um, community groups could bid for relatively small amounts of money to do community history work. And this, again, was a huge shift. And there's been about 160 LGBT community history projects funded by the HLF since then, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And then from the bottom up uh, was the inception of LGBT History Month, initially um, around taking LGBT history into schools. And they came up with this idea of having a month um, echoing Black History Month, uh, which we also celebrate in the UK. And this was, this was what was so interesting about LGBT History Month is that it got taken up very rapidly by local authorities, by li libraries and museums as a kind of hook to fulfill their equalities and social inclusions responsibilities. So, I mean, this sounds rather too cynical, but by putting on a talk or an exhibition in February, the local, local authorities were able to tick that box, as it were, which sounds rather more cynical than I mean it to, mean it to be. OK, so let me hone in on Brighton and three, um, three key projects there. Uh, at, at different moments. So if we look on the left-hand side, this was the Brighton R Story project, uh, initiated in 1988, very significantly, 
at the moment when Clause 28 was passed, at a moment when the LGBT community felt that our voices were about to be silenced, also in a city or town at that point, it was before it had city status, which was hit particularly hard by the AIDS crisis. So we were literally losing voices. And so this, the inception of the uh, Brighton Our Story project was very much in the tradition of history from below, oral history, it was staffed by volunteers, and it was about uh, creating a community archive for the community. And it ran roughly until 2013, but hit some of those problems that community history projects will often uh, hit. That is, the initial volunteers were getting older, they were less able to commit the time, um, it was all voluntary, people were losing interest in a more, e in, in more equality-centered environment, they were ceasing to get donations, um, they were struggling to fund uh, the room where they kept the material, they were, they were struggling to actually open it up to researchers and so on. And so the decision was made to transfer the archive uh, or, 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 or a large section of it into a state of the arts records office, the local uh, authority records office, the keep here being opened by the Queen in a nice florid pink. <laughs> And you can see that the, 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 the archivists were trying to team themselves a little bit, I think. Um, and this raised, again, some really significant issues. There was some real resistance to this archive going, this, this uh, our story archive going into the keep. I mean, there was uh, arguments about assimilation, about flattening out community history, about access, about ownership. Um, which really brought to the fore some of the, some of the ways in which, some of the perils and possibilities of community history. I mean, what I think is quite interesting about it is that it allows this queer community story to be read and examined alongside broad, the broader history of Brighton and Hove. Um, and in fact, the Keep has done a good job, I think, of making this history accessible and thinking about it in those broader perspectives. But there's certainly, it was certainly a kind of sensitive, a sensitive area of debate when it first, uh, first emerged. The other two projects are very different. So these were both um, HLF funded. Um, so they had professional project workers. They were time limited. They had an amount of money and certain things they had to do. They had to fulfill the criteria of the HLF not least in terms of the ideas of community building and com community uh, strengthening. Um, and in these ways, they've had less, in, in a sense, they've been very important in terms of building community, but on another level, they've perhaps been less connected to the community. So there's something quite interesting about what this kind of funding does. And I'm really not criticizing it. In a, I mean, it's been hugely valuable. But there's a very different orientation around what community means in these latter projects than it did in the, in the Brighton R Story project. Um, What's been really interesting about, I mean, the other thing to say about these is that whereas the Brighton R story was very much a community history project for the community, because some of the outputs from Queer in Brighton and Brighton Transformed especially have been more outward facing, there's the idea of an articulation of a community with an urban or city history. Um, so, for example, Brighton Transformed, one of their outputs was this brilliant kind of billboard um, um, project where they took trans stories and, and images of trans people in Brighton and plastered them over billboards in the city. And it really became a talking point for all sorts of people in, in the city. And, and a kind of source of civic pride at this point in 2015. And it spurred or mobilized other projects too. So E.J. Scott, who was involved in the Brighton Transformed project, initiated the Museum of Transology by going into a pub in Brighton called the Marlborough and asking trans people there if they'd like to donate their stories or items that were, were significant to their trans journey. And what was very interesting in this changed environment was I think in 1988 that it might have stopped there with that single glass case. But in this changed environment, uh, the Brighton Museum, which is kind of this landmark, uh, landmark mainstream museum telling the city's story, seized onto what was happening in the Marlborough pub and invited EJ to expand his single cabinet into a whole gallery. And the Museum of Transology has occupied um, that gallery in the Brighton Museum for the past two years. It'll come to an end shortly. And what's really interesting about that work, I think, is that the museum has experienced a phenomenal increase in footfall. Um, so not just trans and LGBT 
uh, people coming to see that exhibition, but it's drawing a much wider audience and has actually been kind of mobilized and bound into a broader kind of civic pride about Brighton's uh, notorious uh, liberalism. So there's something quite interesting about the way in which um, this equalities environment has kind of meshed mainstream history, mainstream institutions with what would have been considered minority histories. So there's something very interesting uh, going on there. It's worth saying that these projects, all three of these projects, these are some of the exhibits from the Museum of Transology. They're very much um, living memory, testimony-based objects that have had personal significance. And this is a, has been a, a hugely important way of hooking people in. It's also really worth thinking, and it's wonderful, so I'm not, I'm, again, this isn't, a, this isn't a criticism of these testimonial-based projects, but it does tend to limit the time frame. So these projects don't go, don't go back any further, really, than the 1950s. Um, and it's as if almost there's not an LGBT history before that. So that's been the emphasis of the HIF-funded projects and the Museum of Transology. Because of this, this emphasis on the individual, I think there can also be a tendency not to delve into the wider social and cultural contexts um, in which these lives were being lived. So it becomes the, because the individual becomes primary, we can sometimes lose that wider context. And I'd say that to varying degrees with the different projects. And I think the other issue around these projects is that they are self-consciously proud histories which of course is hugely important, but also problematic. I've never yet seen a community history project that um, properly engages with misogyny in the, in the gay community, for example. And I think what we tend to do is produce these histories in these contexts, which can be self-consciously celebratory and proud, very important. But I wonder sometimes what happens about tugging through these other, other strands, these other important uh, threads of our past, which may now feel more shameful. So I'm not going to talk about these because I'm, I'm aware of time, but these, there's been proliferating projects across the country, um, fostered um, through engagements with important museums. This is the People's History Museum in, in Manchester, which has been really important to LGBTQ history work with the Heritage Lottery Fund. And it's also been taken up by our, rather belatedly, by our heritage bodies. So this was um, something Sean talked about. Shane talked about in San Francisco something very similar um, being uh, piloted by, heritage, by our, our heritage body Historic England which was a, a national mapping project so individuals and groups getting together and pinpointing literally places of historic uh, interest and it resulted in what I'd see as a kind of eclectic uneven utterly compelling mapping of England, and you can delve into these different places. And what I find especially interesting about it is it gives a kind of snapshot of a historical queer consciousness in 2015. In other words, we can see what people are seeing as historically significant. And I'd suggest that the things that we're seeing as historically significant in 2015 are very different from the things people were seeing as historically significant in 1988, for example. And those things tend to be personal experiences. So this was the place I was homophobically attacked. This was the place I had my first kiss and so on. So again, very much within living memory, very much in a way allied to traditions of family history. What's in my direct alignment? Okay, so there's something very interesting, I think, about what these projects throw up about which histories matter and which histories matter to us now. Let me come to the National Trust. So the National Trust, um, um, I think, felt a push to take up these issues. It was the last heritage body to do so. And it was a particular challenge, I think, for the Trust, um, which cares for our historic houses and places of outstanding national beauty. And though it has very radical roots in the late 19th century, it's become associated closely with a staid, middle-class, white, and rather conservative Englishness. Now, the National Trust engaged in localised place-based projects in London. They commissioned an audio guide of Soho, for example, which I was involved in, and they were behind the recreation of a 1930s queer club, the Caravan Club, also in London. But these catered or have been taken up, were taken up largely by queer audiences and very much on, on queer turf, Soho and London. And so the bigger challenge for the Trust was thinking about its 
um, its stately homes and properties, and, try, and to try and fulfill this new mission statement, which was forever for everyone. And what they came up with was a series of anniversaries of which the LGBT was the first. So this was 2017, it was 50 years since the partial decriminalization of homosexuality in the UK. Last year um, was the feminist year, it looked at suffrage. This year um, is looking at black history in association. And the idea is to kind of pull through threads through their, through their interpretation of some of their historic houses in this work. Now, it created absolute tabloid fury, especially in our big circulation tabloid, conservative tabloid, the Daily Mail. They saw this as political correctness gone mad. There was the idea, I think, that these were queer imposters in this history rather than a part of that history. So when at Kingston Lacey, there was an artistic, uh, an art installation of um, nooses each one representing one of the sodomites hung in the UK. In, in the, UK. Um, the, uh, the reportage in the Daily Mail was that this was a PC stunt. Okay. So this was the kind of environment um, in which I was working. And I think that the Trust was really trying to walk a very fine line. This was very different um, from a museum in Britain's gay capital. Very different from the People's History Museum in Manchester, um, where, where the radical and the off-bean might be expected. Neither was it um, an explicitly labelled queer exhibition. This was historic houses where people might stumble upon a gay display or installation. And we were talking about our stately homes and our national heritage and who belonged to that. So this was quite a complicated dialogue. Um, which I don't think I was fully aware of when I agreed uh, to co-author the guidebook. And what I want to do very briefly is just highlight a couple of the issues that we had to confront in writing this guidebook. And then say a little bit about intangible heritage, if I have a couple of spare minutes at the end. So... This guidebook turned out to be a real negotiation. I've been very used to writing the histories I wanted and not negotiating them with a heritage body who were thinking about the Daily Mail. And the first thing was around this conservatism, which needed, we decided needed negotiating rather than confronting. So we decided to go for a guidebook that actually very closely followed their conventional layout and approach. So initially we'd thought of looking at queer themes but in fact, in the end, we went for people and places, which is exactly what all their guidebooks do. And I was convinced in the end that this was the right approach because it made the familiar a little queer or strange. It was more likely to be picked up by an audience which might not otherwise have done so. And it enacted a dance of queer and normal, which is, after all, at the root of the histories we're trying to present. The other problem was what, who or what we should include, and there was a particular uh, debate around Octavia Hill, who was one of the founders of the National Trust and herself had long-standing intimate friendships with other women. She was, married, she was married, she was buried with one of her female friends. The National Trust asked us not to include her because they were worried about the conservative response from the Daily Mail and others, and they were also concerned about how we could claim her as a lesbian. You know, she never said, I'm a lesbian. We argue, this was the one we really argued for. We said, you know, she's absolutely fundamental to the foundation of the trust, and we said she gives us an opportunity to think more expansively about queer history and what it means. Um, so about intimacy, friendship, rather than necessarily identity, in a, at a point in time before this binary organisation of sexuality really became entrenched. Finally, they agreed that we could include her, that's the spoiler, um, although at the end rather than at the beginning of our guidebook. So you'll find her in there if you wanted to have a look. The other problem... Um, that we came up against in, the, in, this, uh, in writing this guidebook is around evidence and the burden of proof and evidence. And in a sense, with Octavia Hill, we were fine. We had love letters, we had the joint grave, and so on. So we could make that argument and discussion about same-sex love and friendship. But typically, this kind of material tended not to be available for lives deliberately lived under the radar or lives viewed as too insignificant to be of much account. 
Now, the National Trust, because they felt they were treading so, on such sensitive uh, uh, toes, wanted very clear and direct evidence of our claims. They wanted to be incredibly robust in what we were presenting, which might be all right and proper, but it made an already aristocratically laden guidebook even more so. So this is the front and back cover, both prominent bohemians and aristocrats. We manage side stories of a few servants and a jockey, but the more speculative and I think more interesting pages that we produced to draw in working class lives, for example, were ultimately cut. And this led me to think a lot about intangible heritage and the way in which we might suggest and signal lives and connections beyond direct material traces, beyond, for example, the recent listing of sites of LGBT significance and blue plaques in the UK, as crucial as those endeavours are. And I'm going to talk really fast now because I've got a minute left. Let me just very quickly give you one example. So these are the back-to-back -back houses that the National Trust owns in Birmingham, in the English Midlands, one of the very few working-class properties that they own. I wanted to include these. They've been beautifully restored by the Trust, but with no mention of queer strands to lives lived here, because there's no evidence of that. And yet what I argued in the page that ultimately got dropped is that we can confidently suppose that the lives these people were living brushed up against queerness on a daily basis, and that by evoking the ways in which that happened, we can begin to imagine something of that dance of queer and normal, and something also about the wider conditions in which intimate lives were lived. This, I supposed, might be, a, might be as interesting as showcasing the life of a man exposed in a court case for gross indecency, and would make a different point. Now, my time's up. <laughs> Can I have a minute? And I'll, I'll just wrap up really quickly. Just to say, um, in haste, that what I tried to do <laughs> is build up layers around this. So rather than finding a particular individual, I tried to build up different level, layers. So around the physical environment and space and what that meant for ideas of intimacy, privacy, and friendship. The lack of washing or of adequate washing facilities, which meant people that lived in these uh, properties would go to the local bathhouses, which were the subject of various scandals. We can confidently suppose that people that went to these bathhouses witnessed, brushed up against, maybe were involved in queer goings on there. And we can say the same about the theatre and theatrical pub that were opposite, um, that were visited regularly by Fred Barnes, who occupied another back-to-back -back nearby and was a drag performer involved in a local scandal. There are local public sex sites as well. They're not usually as busy as this. So in this specific example, and also in what I've said about weaving of LGBT experience into mainstream collections and exhibits, I think we can see ways of exploring that dance of queer and normal, rather than separating one from the other. The other issue I'm raising in relation to class is about evidence and how we read buildings and their surroundings. A lack of evidence shouldn't stop us thinking creatively, queerly, about how contexts stack up and what they suggest to us. This might be the only way of signalling lives that have been lived beyond the record and which without such supposition might disappear from view altogether. Shifting countries, we're going to be having now uh, Michael DeGaro immigrated as a refugee to the United States in 2012 from Nigeria after being outed in a Washington Post article. In his native Nigeria, Michael was a grassroots organizer supporting homeless gay teens and founded the first Nigerian organization to support HIV positive men. And since moving to New York, Michael continues to advocate for improved social systems and services for LGBTQ IQ asylum and refugee seekers. He's currently the program manager of the AIDS Vaccine Advocacy Coalition, providing strategic support for HIV prevention globally while attending the new school. I'd like to introduce Michael now. Hi, everyone. Um, so I did not prepare a presentation. Um, I'm in a PowerPoint presentation. But I did, um, I'm just going to have a conversation with you guys. Um, and I'm Michael Ligodaro. I'm Nigerian. Uh, I moved here uh, about 12 years ago. Let me repeat that. Um, eight years ago, 2012. Um, and uh, I am an activist and LGBT organizer in Nigeria and also across the continent of Africa. So I'm going to speak a little bit about our history um, as an LGBT uh, activist in Africa. Um, 
an history that we are still making, <laughs> it tells you why I didn't have a PowerPoint presentation because uh, we are still writing our own history and it's still a very young uh, movement in Africa. Um, and I'm gonna share with you from my experience of working on the continent and organizing in Nigeria specifically and how we have moved from the early 2000s till 2019. Um, so I'm just gonna share a particular story uh, a little bit about myself first. So I left my parents' home at the age of 14. I'm 28 now, um, and because they found that I was gay, and I moved to the street, and from there, I started working with gay teens in the street. Um, I think by that time, we were just trying to really survive. We didn't know we were creating a movement. We were just trying to survive and live, you know, see the next day. Um, and I think from there, we were hanging out, you know, under the bridges and friend's house, uh, living by ourselves. And I think at some point, we have about 12, 13 young gay men between the ages of 12 to 21 living in the same apartment, um, just trying to, you know, survive. And I think um, at that point, some of us were just dying. You know, we didn't know what was happening to us. I think we later found that it was HIV. Uh, but then we just thought there was something that was wrong and people were just dying. Um, I think there was thing about HIV then that came out in the early 20s was you know, HIV was a disease or an infection that only affects heterosexual individuals. And for gay men in Nigeria or in, in the continent of Africa, we, we had this thing about being gay in Africa that if you could go through what we've gone through, there must be something protecting us. We thought there was a fairy godmother that you know protected gay people in Africa because like we've been through hell and you know we continue to persevere and continue like you know we continue to exist in our own little world. So earlier then we thought like you know we could be you know infected with HIV because like nobody talked about it. Like all the information about HIV then was it was between a male and a female. So we just assumed that you know it was something that never could affect us. So that's how our movement started. Like our movement started from trying to survive from this deadly disease that you know that was killing our friends, and went to know more about it. Um, I think from there we got some you know organizing, and then for me particularly, I started an organization that particularly cared for gay men who were living with HIV because I just lost like five friends within five months, and it was devastating for me. So I had to find out what was going on, and. We created an organization called Brothers Keepers, um, which cared for gay teens between the ages of 12, 15, 16, to 21, to sort of just you know, try to see what was going on. And I moved from my little town called Benin City in Nigeria to the capital city, Abuja. So I found out about this more advanced gay organization. It was the first LGBT organization in Nigeria. It was called Alliance Right, which has now changed its name to International Center for Advocacy on Right to Health. So all of our movement building was tied to HIV. And not a lot of us cared about what was going on between our human rights, like violations. Some of us were being attacked. Some of us were really homeless. There was a law in 2017 that was introduced into the parliament by the then Nigerian president, Olusegun Obasanjo. Um, and I think the law came just before in 2005 when Nigeria hosted the first uh, Africa AIDS conference. And then there was, we had a young movement then that was vibrant, that cared about health reasons. So we had like a parade during the opening ceremony of the conference and the president was, oh, angry, there was anger, like how, where did these people live? Like, are these guys from Nigeria? Like, how come, like, we allowed these individuals to come protest about, you know, their rights here? This is not normal. Um, we're not protesting about our rights, we're just asking for access to prevention and care services at the conference, because the conference was about HIV. So, it was normal for people who are working in this field to come protest. But some of us were dressed, you know, in drags and, you know, um, you know looking fabulous and queens, so the president got angry. Um, and the next morning, he introduced the bill, the first uh, anti-gay uh, law in Nigeria in 2017 because of that process that, that happened. Um, later that year, um, it took him like from 2005 to 2017 to 2007 to decide what he really wanted to the law to be because already we had this British penal code that the British came up with, like my friend earlier spoke about the guy, um, the Indian guy spoke about, about uh, the British, because the British really 
they introduced homosexuality in, 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 in penal code in, in Africa. A lot of us, we knew, we had history back, like, uh, like our grandparents told us stories about their friends or their, or this, uh, their uh, a king or a queen who had wives, a king who had other male as, you know, as wives as well. So we had history about homosexuality. We even had native languages for it. It wasn't criminalized until the British came, you know, to the continent and introduced this law that, you know, this is not normal. Uh, you guys should be criminalizing this. So beside the, the, the already existing law, the president wanted to advance it because he felt that was good enough. So he wanted to tie into marriage. So marriage is an institution in Nigeria that's really, really, you know, strong. Like Africans think marriage is something that should be protected and it should be between male and a female. Um, and also necessarily, it wasn't really about, uh, not that you know, lesbianism wasn't criminalized in the continent, but it, more, it was more about anisa, inner sex and masculinity. People felt like a man and a man shouldn't be involved in sexual acts. That is an abomination, and that is what that was the core of what Africans, a lot of African government, especially in Nigeria, want to criminalize. Um, so for us, we thought like we, I think I, then I was like 18 already, um, and we thought like we want to we wanted to fight back, and we wanted to like you know um, fight against that law. And there were public hearings that happened in Nigeria, and at the same time. We had the same conversations going on in Ghana and in Uganda. So it was like a continental, especially West Africa, people were having this discussion about how do we criminalize LGBT populations, specifically gay LGBT people. Um, so, and I think in, 20, uh, in 2011, so this law was not passed from when it was introduced in 20, 2007 till until 2011. But before then, there was a window where a lot of LGBT organizations was coming up in different parts of the continent because we had this our government do, making speeches and in so, like and I know there was uh, the Congo president make a, made a speech in at the UN saying there is no LGBT people in, in this country. So that brought people in that country to organize, and there was the first LGBT organization in that country that came up. So people around the continent started like organizing, and I think activists in Nigeria, Uganda, were taking the lead in terms of organizing and highlighting our friends in other parts of the continent. So I traveled from Liberia, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Sudan, sort of just trying to understand what our friends, our stories in those parts of the world, what they felt like, if it was different from us, or how we could organize together. Um, so we felt like it was the same, so our stories were similar. We had a very young group of activists who were trying to define what their movement look, need to look like. Because it felt like people did not understand that this is your right, like your constitution said it can be protected and you have a basic human right that, it, that your government has signed it to, so you need to protect it. So a lot of them were just thinking about, hey, first of all, I'm hungry, I'm on the street, um, you know, I have this daily disease, I just want to survive. So I don't care about these other rights, can I just get these basic things first? So that was what people really cared about, like I want, I want housing, I want education, I, want, I don't want to be uh, afraid of walking on the streets, I just want to be safe. I don't really care about having gay rights or you know, marriage rights, I just really want to be safe. So those are the core things that our, our movement, I think, continues to be the core themes of our movement in Africa. A lot of us do not really, not that we don't care about getting married, we do care about getting married, but we don't see it as a reality in our country right now. But what we do see as a reality is that we want to be protected. Right, we want to have, we want to have access to health care, we want to have access to education and jobs like everyone else. So. That's why I said our movement is very new. Like you know, we we are still you know trying to understand what our movement, what need to be the core values of our movement. Um, so again, back to 2011, my friend David Cato, who was the uh, uh, the lead of an organization, Sexual Minority Uganda, was murdered in in January of 2011. So that brought a lot of attention to LGBT rights in, in Africa, the UK, the UN, you know, the US. A lot of people started paying attention. Before that, people didn't really pay attention to Africa LGBT movement. People thought, you know, yeah, the people are there, but I don't really know who is there, you know, who works there. I mean, we had a lot, some friends who work in foundations, who work in UNAIDS, for instance, who, you know, had contacts with LGBT organizations on the continent. But before 2011, people didn't really care too much, right? So I think David Katz's death 
brought a lot of attention and people wanted to find out what was going on in Uganda, specifically Uganda. All right. um, and I think a lot of us in West Africa thought, well, Uganda, this attention to Uganda, what can we learn from it? Right. This was like a bad, bad, bad thing that happened. This guy was murdered. Someone who was very close to me was murdered. So, and you know, the world now pays attention to the situation. So, how do we owe the attention now to see how we can create a movement from this tragic incident? Um, so, that was when the first African um, Men for Social Health and Rights organizations was founded by my friend Joel Nana, uh, who is also late now. It was like an organization that cared, that connected the continent LGBT, first of all, gay organizations together. Um, and then we were trying to organize and define what we, what we need to look like. But our first intention was to, was to start organizing and just be ourselves, right? To create a space where we can be free. And I think Joel, I was just speaking about Joel with some students yesterday, and I think he brought something unique to our movement. Before that, we used to be very, it's very sad movement, right? Like we used to like, there was not so much fun about it, like about organizing it, but it's very, like trying to not to get killed, for instance, trying to you know get medication, like those really, really real life issues. Um, but Joel brought fun to want to be an activist in the continent. Um, and <laughs> Ms. Mitya, I want to remember him. Um, Joel organized the first African LGBT conference in, in Johannesburg, South Africa in 2011 in November. And he brought a lot of gay activists from all over the continent to, to Johannesburg. And that just being there, seeing those people, people that you work with, that you're creating a movement with, and before that, we didn't have the time to do that because a lot of us were really busy, like very young people. Um, and he made it for you to see that beyond these sufferings and beyond these things we're going through, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, which is like, you might not leave to see this amazing continent becoming to accept people like Angola now, um, but there's a light ahead of the tunnel, so we can really work hard now and, and have fun while doing it. Um, Joel passed in 2013. Um, and me, me so rest in peace. So our movement then was really, you know, NGO based, um, really structured around healthcare. But I think I was just in Nigeria uh, last month where I'm doing a documentary for HBO. And we went there to see uh, what the movement now looks like. And I'm a, I can tell you, our movement, not just in Nigeria, like the, there's a young, vibrant, movement changing the way we used to work in the continent, which is like, we don't necessarily, those guys don't not necessarily need to be part of an organization. They can be young, they can go on social media, which is taking charge and be themselves and be free on social media, right? Like we have a, a ton of like social media uh, uh, activists. No, they don't come as activists, they're just like young, gay, transgender, intersex people being themselves on Instagram and they have millions of followers. They are Nigerians, South Africans, Kenyans, and people follow them, but they have that, they, sh they show themselves, their real self on the internet, but they are, they are not able to do that on the street, but people can buy into it and see them, this is the person that I want to be, and this is the person I want to be free to look like, and they're changing that, and we don't know what that looks like yet. A lot of us that, that, that started the movement, we are surprised by this new wave of you know, young people being themselves on social media, which are not going to understand how we can buy into this, but also we are letting let them have fun, right? This is you, this is like the new movement, like this is what it looks like right now. How do we make this already structured NGO movement that we've created for the past 10 years to now buy into this 2019 way of people being themselves? That they, don't, that they are not afraid of being attacked or they're not afraid of being arrested anymore. Yes, people are still being arrested, people are still being killed, but this fearless new wave of activists. I call them activists because I think it, it takes you braveness to be able to show yourself, no matter how you do it. So I think they are activists. To, 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 to be able to show themselves online and be themselves online, even though they are not able to do it on the streets. So I think how do we buy into that? How do we kind of merge both them, but of them? And I told my friends, I think um, our movement is, uh, how do I say, is like Facebook, and the new movement is Instagram. When I say Facebook, like, like nobody be, don't go on Facebook anymore. People go on Instagram now. So 
So a past movement like Facebook, so the movement right now in Africa is Instagram. So how do we kind of buy into that and manage that and, look, and make and take the what we've learned from it, the old guys, to merge this new wave of activism and make our continent and tell our own story. Um, and although we don't have it written down, and it, it's, it pains me that all of those things that happened 10 years ago, we don't have uh, we couldn't have pictures, I mean, we have some pictures, but I think a lot of us were so scared to show our faces in those times, and there was no real documentation of it. And right now, for me, what is important to me is, is to tell our stories. And I think using the media, um, and I think also protecting our story, and not let people sensationalize it. I mean, I think it's important that black, gay, queer, lesbian, transgender people, no matter what we are, to tell our stories and to show our stories. And that's why I'm so grateful HBO for doing this series with me. And to see the way that beyond what the Western world has created about LGBT people, that Africa, like we have LGBT history. We have places whereby you know, we grew up and we have those stories, those amazing stories we want to tell, we want to show our people. And I want to create that. Yes, it can be written down, but we can portray it on media where people are now able to see things differently. Um, yeah, I think for me, my life uh, uh, has been, you know, on the scale. I think I feel I'm like 50 years old or 80 years old now. I'm just 28 years old, um, <laughs> and and I think it's, it's it tells you the and I'm talking about LGBT issue in Africa. So it tells you where our movement is and where we're going. And we're learning from our friends in San Francisco and in New York. Um, and I think, you know, I think for us, one of the groups that we've really, really looked up to is ACT UP in New York. And I think ACT UP is one of the group that, you know, for me specifically, back in Nigeria, I've always heard about them, the AIDS movement in Africa, in, in the US. And I think we've also learned from them to see how can we replicate what you get started because our movement started with HIV too, right? So our friends were dying, we were trying to see how we can make our friends survive and how do we tie those things together and make our own story and tell our own story better. Um, I understand I speak so fast. I hope you guys heard some things I said. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. So, um, well, thank you. Um, I wish Ankit could be here. Um, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Michael. I think it, it's amazing because it really has offered such varying um, perspectives and actual real world um, risks and lives are on the line. And again, as I said earlier, the privilege we have sitting here in New York City talking about LGBT place-based place heritage is uh, quite profound um, considering what, what you fled and what you just came back to, but the trajectory of that is really pretty amazing. Um, I'm just curious, I'll, you know, listening to you talk and knowing that you're, you were just back in Nigeria, um, is the documentary, did you go to some of the places that you were living as place, you know, placed historians? Were, is there a resonance, a resonance for you of going to a place where you were or you protested or survived that is part of the documentary? Yeah, actually, I haven't been back home since I left. I mean, when I mean left my parents' home, I left at the age of 14, and I haven't been back home ever since then. So this film took me back home to my parents' house for the first time, which was like really um, emotional for me to be back um, and to see where I grew up and I couldn't re really remember some part of it. So, um, so this documentary, although it's centered around my, me and my friends, it also around you know the growing wave of new LGBT movement in Africa, specifically in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, so going back and seeing those places where I grew up and where we started, so we had us when I was growing up, we had us like uh, on that someone at the bridge where we normally like meet up every Sunday afternoon. So we went back there to film there, and you know, all the places changed a lot, you know, mm -hmm. the years. So yeah, so we like go to specific places mm -hmm. to see things. Like those, we don't see them as like an LGBT historical site mm -hmm. per se, but these are sites that we remember as places where our movement sort of just started from. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm also curious, before we just open it up, you know, the, you mentioned ACT UP, and on our project, we self-consciously, I love the term you use, self-consciously proud. Um, we include ACT UP and this New York Stock Exchange, for example, as a place where um, they protested the price of AZT in 1989 and so forth. Um, it's interesting how Stonewall was a 
crappy mafia rum bar that people loved to hate. And I should say hated, but loved, because it was an only opportunity. But the issue of it changing over time to a place of celebration and commemoration that now just has national and international ramifications. But how, how do you deal with shifting meanings over time and authenticity? Stonewall um, just happens to be a bar named Stonewall that went in there in 1990, you know, if it was the Chinese restaurant at one point that it was. Do we really care about the, the impact of Stonewall today if it was a shoe store or something else? And is it an issue for you in the UK? It's a really interesting question. I think I was very struck on the walking tour this morning how the Stone, Stonewall Inn's significance grew in the years that followed and mm -hmm. the way in which it became a kind of icon retrospectively. Um, and one of the very interesting things that's happening in the UK in the work I'm doing beyond London in this latest project is this search for authenticity. So a lot of the interviews I was doing in Manchester and Brighton were very critical of what they saw as the generic, sterile gay scene, the gay village in Manchester, for example, mm -hmm. um, and searching for the authentic, working class, real queen bars or drag bars or whatever from the 50s and 60s. And it really raised for me the, what this question of authenticity actually means, because you could talk about the gay village in Manchester being quintessentially Mancunian and very much being about a Manchester history. But there's these kind of waves or generations of what feels um, resonant, authentic, and so on. And so there's now this new scene with a new generation of people bypassing the village. They say, well, the village is just for tourists and for older gays. You know, and the, now the, the, the real, the, where, where it's really at, the authentic scene is in these um, old bars and stuff where they're starting to do kind of reinvent Manchester drag and so on. So there's something very interesting, I think, about these waves of authenticity and what it means and when you reach back to. So it's almost like the late 90s, early 2000s wasn't the authentic pe period of queerness. Mm -hmm. It was the 50s and 60s that people mm -hmm. are harking back to and when we had drag performances in working men's clubs and so on. So there's something very mm -hmm. interesting about when we look to at particular moments in time. And I also just... Th th Anecdotally, yeah. boy, between Ankit and uh, Nigeria, the, you, you, the Brits really did a great job with yeah. colonialization. <laughs> I'm <laughs> really so proud. Right. <laughs> um, they did apologize, though. They just <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> They did, right. Yeah. Um, uh, the, yes, Ken. So, so Keeping, are they keeping this up? Is this becoming part of the uh, general interpretation at the National Trust sites? What's happening? So you touch on a debate that I didn't touch on, but it's exactly this. I mean, what these anniversaries and what these months do is they provide an obvious platform. So 2017, you couldn't go to you couldn't go to any heritage site in the country. It felt like without having something about this this uh, 50 year anniversary. But they're, and the same with February, you know, the, you know, most local authorities will have something going on about LGBT History Month. And on the one hand, that platform is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, it's a bit like this is where we can tick that box and move on. So it can result in these kind of siloed histories, if you like, where on the one hand, you know, you get this flourishing and then it dies back down again. Um, and that's very much, I think, what's happened with 2017. So some of the houses, I think, that did particularly sex successful events have kind of woven some sort of commentary into their guidebooks and into their presentation, but most haven't. Um, so I think there is, a, there is a sense sometimes of kind of, of, we've done that, we're moving on. It's black history this year, it's feminism this year. Um, and I think there's a danger um, of what happens to those threads and the need to kind of keep tugging them through in a sense. You know, we talked earlier just about um, history ground up versus sort of the National Trust sort of mm -hmm. corporatization or professionalization of it. And I think, I mean, this isn't the catch all, but through Instagram, I'm always fascinated about the stories that are being told by individuals, such as what you mentioned, but also by grassroots advocates, enthusiasts, such as you know, her story or the AIDS Memorial, which is an amazing re resource on Instagram or the LGBT underscore history project or Facebook pages that with people who are running them in this audience. So 
you know, that I think is an opportunity to at least seed additional interest and sustain it to a certain degree. Yes. And then Michael. I remember um, reading reports about American fundamentalists, uh, fun members of fundamentalist churches going to Africa, uh, to countries like Uganda, and influencing uh, politicians to um, implement these drastic anti-gay laws. Uh, do you know anything about that? Yeah, you know, we have, uh, so I, I'm going to speak for myself. I have uh, a thing about that. I think that part of our history is just on the side, really. Um, and I think a lot of us, sometimes we feel that, you know, there's always these tendencies of Western world coming to tell the stories and coming to be part of our story. And I think the El African LGBT story is one that is written in Africa and by Africans. And I think those fundamentalists that come, they're just on the sidetrack of the story. And they don't get to define how our story has been told. They don't get to define how, what is changing in our, in, our, in our continent. They're just on the sidetrack. Yes, they have some effects on how you know, the, the continent is, is structuring the laws. But I think at the end of the day, our government is, is inherently homophobic, right? And they are trying to like, uh, criminalize LGBT people. So fundamentalists coming from the US, coming from Europe, trying to change our stories, that is just on the side track. And they don't really matter so much to the story. Yes, gentlemen, I have a question for each of you. One is, is like the young man in uh, Mumbai, are there no um, artistic artifacts or places, mm -hmm. since we're talking about historic preservation, that um, represent the pervasiveness of same-sex sexuality in African culture before the introduction of Islam or Christianity by imperialism. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't, if, if there are, or, or even if there aren't, even if there are only those stories that you set, refer to from your families, aren't people convinced that this is some sort of imposition, <laughs> this hatred of, of LGBT people? Uh, imposed by the West and imposed by Islam that has nothing to do with um, African heritage? You know, that's an interesting perspective. And I think for us, the way I've seen it is that a lot of African historians will tell, tell you differently. They will tell you, yes, those things exist, but they, can, they won't say specifically those are homosexuality or some homosexual acts, right? They will tell you, yes, those women uh, who were marrying other women, they were just marrying there for protection they were not necessarily engaging in homosexual act. So this, those historians would try to change it and switch it up for you, for us, a lot of the time, but we know, like, a woman marrying another woman as a, as a queen, as a wife, obviously there's some tendency or some act going on in there, but they would, you know, redefine it for us. So those, those stories exist, but the way they've, they've, been, they've been written or rewritten again by African historians is different from what we know that our parents continue to tell us or what it portrayed us. And, and then I just wanted to ask, or to underscore, mm -hmm. so you mean to say that if one goes to Kingston Lacey or to um, uh, Watson Manor, that there's nothing in their narrative that they relate to people about the crucial role that homosexuality played in terms of these places being uh, built and enriched? Uh, there is now. And more, there's more now. I think there's, there's, there's two levels for this. So at Kingston Lacey, I think there was, before 2017, I think you could kind of, sign, kind of read between various lines around interior design and some of these stereotypes and ideas. It was brought to the fore in 2017. And one of the key things that the Trust talks about is um, what happened to the volunteer body during 2017. So in the houses which engaged in that memorial year, 
um, they did a lot of work with volunteers who, who do the interpretative work for visitors, explaining you know, the, what was going on in the house and so on. So at Kingston Lacey, now it's quite common for volunteer guides to include something of what they learned from that 2017 year. I think the work that needs doing that might be more tangible is on the house guidebook, which I'm hoping that when those get revisited and rewritten, you'll get some of these threads drawn through uh, more decisively than they are at the moment. So I think there's kind of different levels. There's the kind of, I suppose, tangible markers in guides book, books and display boards. Mm -hmm. And then it's also about the way in which guides are incorporating what they learned from that year in what they deliver to guests and visitors to the house. But not about Baron de Rothschild. Say again? But nothing about Baron Ferdinand de Rothschild at, at Watson. Not, not about? Baron no. Ferdinand de Rothschild at Watson Manor. I, I, I don't know specifically about uh, what, what they've done with that. So. Yes. <coughs> Well, amazing presentations and testimonies. I, I would like to do very fast three questions that are, are dealing with very contemporary issues that uh, are preservation of uh, queer and LGBTQ uh, sites uh, uh, it's, uh, we're facing uh, now in regards to these two things. The first has to do uh, with something that you mentioned is the, uh, the, let's say, sites that are online. And there's a, a big part of online sites that became crucial in a number of LGBTQ struggles mm -hmm. and that are very differ, difficult to preserve. Uh, uh, and it's, it's very specific. How do we deal, for instance, with uh, Minitel in France that became this uh, platform of gay interaction that was very unique, or what is the way, for instance, in, in different locations in Africa that the online interaction has been crucial in the emancipation of uh, a number of uh, LGBTQ uh, uh, people and communities and, and networks. The second question is about HIV. And again, it's with the specifics of that history and those sites. It's something that very much deals with issues of medical records, with uh, governmental policies that are mainly kept secret, and the difficulty of doing research, even uh, with the HIV uh, uh, records, it's something in regards to gay activism or many other things that you've been discussing, for instance, uh, it's, it's really very specific. Uh, and the third one, it's, it's, it's about something that, for instance, in London or New York, it's, it's huge. It's basically the way gayness uh, was turned, was moving from, let's say, queerness to something that became uh, nor kind of even normative and uh, a lifestyle that could become actually a force of gentrification and even uh, uh, a force of uh, dequeering our societies. So these three topics are crucial and it's kind of very difficult to address them from the point of view of preservation. So because you've been touching them, I, I'd love to know your, your uh, take on this. Well, I, I think they are three topics that probably warrant a whole other kind of conversation. Um, ooh, the project that Andrew, Jay, and I and Amanda uh, are working on, are, it's a place-based heritage program, cultural landscape project. Um, that are within the confines of extant locations. Um, and we're within the confines of preservationists wanting the extant building to be there. Um, so if, for example, Greenwich Village is fortuitous because it has an overlay of a historic district, those buildings were survived, whereas many of the locations that were LGBTQ related in Harlem have been demolished over the years. So to the answer the question about HIV, I mean, there's, that's a documentation issue on some level, an archival record keeping issue. We're looking at a category of activism as one category of locations. We're looking at medical discovery. So we're including them sort of in the, you know, the, the framework of our categorization. Um, I don't think that's answering the, the broader question, but we're addressing sort of dis medical discovery in that, in that role as well as activism. Um, I'm probably missing a ton of other answers to the question to the topics that you threw out there, um, but again, the fluidity of identity is so broad in New York, ranging from Alice Austin in the 19th century, who would never identify as a lesbian but had an intimate same-sex relationship, to 
pre and post World War II and so forth. So it's it's a big topic that I'm not going to be able to answer here. 